Well, for more on all of this, I'm joined by Kurt Volker, who formerly served as United States Ambassador to NATO. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on World News America. Um, the Taliban press conference today, um, it was extraordinary for many reasons, uh, hearing the thoughts uh, straight from them in a former Afghan government media center. Uh, do you think the U.S. can work with the Taliban after seeing that conference? Well, I think uh, the Taliban have obviously gotten some very good PR coaching, and they're saying a lot of the things that would be reassuring to the international community or to the Afghan people in order to ease their path towards consolidating power. What has to be seen is how they behave in power. And I think that it is still um, something that I think we should all be very skeptical about, given their track record and their ideology, that they will, in fact, treat people well, that they will, in fact, govern in a responsible way, that there will not be retribution. I find that very hard to believe, but we have to see. Well, with that, uh, so things are in limbo, so to speak. What responsibility do you think uh, President Biden and the United States has to the people of Afghanistan? And I'm talking more widely than those that work directly with them as translators or contractors. Well, absolutely. I think we have a tremendous responsibility. And, and this, is, um, th this is a series of events that didn't have to happen. Uh, we were doing fine with the status quo at minimal expense, minimal loss of life, empowering the Afghan forces. But as we began to pull out, it just paved the way for the Taliban to militarily seize power. Uh, it didn't have to go that way. And I think we still owe the Afghan people some uh, measure of support and assistance so that they know that uh, we still want to see them be successful. Um, I'm wondering what you make of Mr. Volker. Mr. Biden has not been in touch with other international leaders. What do you think that tells us about the U.S.'s future relationship with NATO allies? Well, that's a great question. I, I know that Secretary of State Blinken has been making the phone calls all day. And I, I've seen reports of uh, phone calls he's had with the Gulf states, with some NATO allies. Uh, but I do think that it is incumbent upon the president to be reassuring to NATO allies that just because we walked away from Afghanistan, and frankly, with relatively little consultation, mm -hmm. that we will remain uh, true to our commitments both within NATO and to our international interests, uh, where we hope to still work together with our NATO allies. You know, I just saw a poll come in, Reuters, Ipsos, just before coming to air, and it said 68 percent of Americans agree it was always going to end badly in Afghanistan. Do you agree with that assessment of most Americans? Well, it, it, you know, it's an opinion poll, so people are expressing their opinion. I don't think it had to end this badly. I think that we could have uh, planned more. We could have given the Afghans more time. Uh, we could have invested more over many years. I think over several administrations, we were minimizing what we were trying to do as opposed to trying to accomplish our, our fundamental objectives. Thank you so much for joining us, Kurt Volker, and we'll see how uh, this evolves over the coming days. Uh, but I want to look now just very much at the latest events in Afghanistan closely. What could we possibly expect next? Our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, joins us from Dubai. Lise, thank you so much for joining us again. I found that press conference uh, extraordinary today to watch. Um, I'm wondering, did anything surprise you? I have to say it was, it was quite jarring to see this. I'm Nuala McGovern in Brussels, where the breaking news this hour is that the EU and the UK say they've agreed a new Brexit deal. The Prime Minister says he's got a great new deal that takes back control and he urges Parliament to back it. The President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, he hails the deal as fair and balanced agreement. But... In the past few minutes, Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party has said it still cannot back the deal as things stand.
Now, let us bring you the breaking news this hour. Just uh, over the past 30 minutes or so, Boris Johnson has announced that the UK and the EU have struck a Brexit agreement. So writing on Twitter, the Prime Minister said, we've got a great new deal that takes back control. Now Parliament should get Brexit done on Saturday so we can move on to other priorities. Let me bring you the president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. What he had to say was it was a fair and balanced agreement for the EU and the UK. However, the Democratic Unionist DUP, whose 10 votes the government might need to get the deal approved in the Commons, have said in response that they remain opposed to this deal. Uh, let me bring in Chris Morris uh, from the BBC's Reality Check, who's keeping across all the developments here in the European Council with me. Great to have you with us, Chris. So we've been following uh, over the past half hour some of uh, the developments that have been coming in. Michel Barnier saying we have a deal. They were talking about where there's a will, uh, there is a deal. But it doesn't really solve everything for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. What do you think is going to be his first priority? Well, yeah, what we have is, is clearly a, a broad political deal between the member states of the European Union, including the United Kingdom. They've done a deal. Uh, but we've been here before, don't forget, last year. Theresa May announced the same thing, and that deal was subsequently uh, rejected three times in the House of Commons. And the next big question, of course, is can this deal, and we haven't yet seen a legal test of it, text of it with all the detail, can it get through the House of Commons? And the indications we've had so far from the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland is that they're sticking with the statement they made early this morning, which was that as things stand, they can't accept what's on the table. Have things changed between then and now in the text? We don't know. Uh, but certainly in the last few minutes, uh, a DUP MP has told BBC Northern Ireland our position hasn't changed. And without the DUP, we've discussed this a lot before, the numbers in the House of Commons are going to be very, very difficult for the Prime Minister. So I think we have to wait and see if he's got something else up his sleeve. Uh, we're going to need to see. I think MPs are going to want to see this legal text of, of an agreement to see exactly what it says on issues of customs, on the issue of, of consent, seeking the democratic approval of, of the Northern Ireland Assembly and then we go forward from there but on the EU side I think they'll be thinking you know w this is the second time we've come to a deal let's hope this one actually sticks. Let me read a little bit of it Chris uh, Jean-Claude Juncker saying there's a deal uh, it's fair and balanced a uh, testament to commitment to finding solutions I recommend that you EU co so the European uh, Council so the leaders of the 27 countries endorse this deal so talk our viewers through if they do endorse this deal, or perhaps even before that, how will they get through all that text that hasn't been released and have it translated uh, in time to try and ratify it over between either today or tomorrow? So in terms of the complex legal text, you're right. I mean, this is detailed. Well, let us turn now to big news in football. The Argentinian star Lionel Messi has agreed to a two-year deal to join French club Paris Saint-Germain. In the past half hour or so, French media has confirmed he's passed his medical. Uh, let's take a look at him arriving in Paris wearing a T-shirt that said, This is Paris, uh, the Argentinian football star. He received a hero's welcome look there from the hundreds of fans who came out to greet him. He confirmed his exit from Barcelona. You might have seen the tearful farewell on Sunday after 21 years with the club. Well, Rick Sharma is a football journalist in Barcelona. Good to have you with us, Rick. How does it feel watching those pictures in Paris uh, from a favourite son that has left your city? Yeah, still shocking, really. People can't believe it here. Like I said, mainly shock, but also anger. I think a lot of people are very upset with the, the fact that a player who's lived in Barcelona for 21 years almost now has gone to Paris Saint-Germain when he wanted to stay and the club wanted him to stay. So a mixture of, of confusion, disbelief and anger. And I suppose people might be wondering, you know, just how expensive is he and how badly off are the club of Barcelona? Well, Lionel Messi has been very expensive over the years. He himself was willing to take a 50% pay cut to try and stay. But it wasn't enough because Barcelona are 1 billion euros in debt and they need to get rid of several other players on their wage bill to be able to register with Lionel Messi. So they had to get rid of perhaps Antoine Griezmann, Felipe Coutinho, Samuel Umtiti, Merlin Pjanic, at least three or four of those players to be able to register Messi. And I think in Paris, he's going to be earning around 25 million euros a season net 
for two years and potentially a third year. I wonder as well, Rick, you know, as you follow this, some, some um, commentary I've heard is that some younger fans in particular, they follow a player, not a team. Do you think that could be the case with Barcelona, even sitting in Barcelona, that you would follow Messi in Paris Saint-Germain? Absolutely. I think that's the case in, in modern football. There's already, you know, a lot of Barca fans, especially in international countries abroad, not living in Spain, because the people that live in Catalonia and live in Spain and follow Barca are always going to follow Barca, but they're going to keep an eye out for Lionel Messi. But then the fans who have come perhaps a bit later in, in more recent years, living all over the world, and they've followed basically Messi's been a legend at Barca ever since they've started following football. Those are the fans who are, I mean, they're definitely going to follow what he does at PSG. I don't know if they're going to become Paris Saint-Germain fans, but it wouldn't surprise me. There's absolutely a section of of people who Rick. or football fans nowadays who, who do that. Rick, thank you so much for joining us, giving us the picture from Barcelona as many people watch towards Paris. You're watching Outside Source.